everyone. Let me add my uh, special Happy Father's Day greeting to all the dads out there and grandfathers. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Chapel Street Church. Uh, we're launching, as you've seen, into a brand new series this summer called By Faith. In fact, we started last week looking at Hebrews chapter 11. It'll take us all the way through the summer because the chapter itself lays out with these character studies of people who lived by faith. And perhaps you know people in your life that you admire their faith. You admire the way that they live and their trust in God, and you see in them evidences of what they say they believe. Well, that's essentially what we're given here in Hebrews chapter 11. A number of years ago, I took a group of men down to Louisiana to Angola uh, State Penitentiary, and we visited with the inmates there, uh, many of them serving life sentences. In some ways, a very harsh and dark place. In other ways, a place full of faith and light and hope as well. One of the guys that went on the trip with me from our church, his name is Greg. And Greg said, I'm, I'll go, and I'm, I'm excited, but I'm nervous because I don't really feel comfortable praying out loud with people. Well, the very first night we got there, we were in this uh, church, and believe it or not, they have a ch several churches inside the prison with hundreds of inmates, and we clustered up into groups to pray for each other out loud, holding hands, arms raised. I had to laugh to myself as I looked over my shoulder at Greg, who's stuck with seven or eight guys he did not know who were serving life sentences, praying their hearts out to God. And I'll just tell you, over the course of the several days we spent there, we went to teach, to encourage, to bless those men. But we were the ones who were taught what it means to truly worship by being around those inmates, by seeing their faith in action. Not just in the worship service, but how they lived inside the prison walls, how they treated each other, prayed for one another, and walked in obedience to their father. So we all need examples of what it means to live by faith in our lives. Some of our examples are living next to us, breathing, family members and friends. And some are those we look to the past for. And that's what we're going to do as we look at Hebrews chapter 11, these examples of men and women who lived by faith. Uh, all of these individuals are flawed which ought to give us some encouragement. They're not perfect people. And many of them are unlikely sources, like it was an unlikely source that we'd go to a state maximum security prison to be encouraged in our faith. We go to some of these stories in Hebrews 11, and we find unlikely stories to encourage us and to show us what it means to live by faith. And that's the purpose. So Hebrews 11, as we said last week, is answering two primary questions. Number one, what is faith? And if you missed it last week, I encourage you to go back and watch that sermon and catch up. We'll be referring to that content throughout every week of this series. And the second question is, what does it look like to live by faith? And that's the bulk of the chapter of what we launch into today. First, a little review. What is faith, actually? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, you'll remember from last week, this word that we... Is translated assurance here is actually a Greek word that's also translated substance in some other translations, particularly the King James Version. And the conviction of things not seen. Sometimes this is translated evidence. So faith is the assurance that we have based on something that's of substance. The conviction that we have based on real evidence. So biblical faith, Christian faith, is not blind faith. It's not checking your mind at the door. It's not anti-reason. It's based on something. It, it's built on a foundation that has substance, that's solid, the character and faithfulness of God himself. And then in verse 6 we see, and without faith it is impossible to please him, God, for whoever would draw near to him must first believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him, that he's real and that he's good, in other words. So again, we'll be looking back at what faith is as we go to see what faith does in people's lives. Faith, we said last week, enables us to experience in the present what we hope for in the future. The Old Testament examples we're going to be studying in this chapter were not just commended for what they believed intellectually, but what they did based on those beliefs. If I say to you, show me your faith, it's a question, by the way, that the Apostle James actually asks in his epistle. I'm not asking you to show me a statement of faith that you subscribe to. That's only part of it. But I'm asking, show me how you live in light of what you say you believe. And that's really at the heart of this, this whole series. We said again, biblical faith is living as if God is telling you the truth. Because he is. 
All right, Hebrews 11, verse 4. One verse for the whole sermon this week on our example of faith. Hebrews 11, 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. One verse. Now, let me just say, some of the people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 are familiar names. They're, they're the stars of the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, Noah, and we'll talk about their lives. Some of them are less known, like how many have heard of Enoch or Jephthah? Now, I'm guessing you probably have heard the name Abel and his brother Cain, but how many of us really understand their story and why the, he would be listed as an example of what it means to live by faith? the Faith Hall of Fame. Abel makes it in. Abel is the first example given to us of what it means to live by faith. This phrase, by faith, shows up over and over and over again. It's what we're talking about. It's the title of our series. By faith, Abel. He's the first one. Now, there's a reason for that, because Abel's the first person, and his brother Cain, to have to follow God outside the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve knew God in a way that Abel didn't. They walked with him in the cool of the day. They had access to him in intimacy. Because of their sin in Genesis 3, that fellowship was broken, and they're outside the garden, and Abel now is living by faith. He doesn't have the access that his parents had. And he's commended to us as an example of what it means to live by faith. Now, to do anything at all by faith means to do it in response to who God is and in accordance with what God has said. Let me say that again. To do anything by faith is to do it in response to who God is and in accordance with what God has said. Abel is held out to us as an example of worship. What does it mean to worship by faith? That's the question. What does it mean to worship by faith? What does it mean to worship in response to who God is and in accordance with what God has said? This is what the story of Abel is meant to teach us. But all we get is one verse. Just one verse in verse 4. Let me give you a little background here because we're going to have to go back to Genesis in just a moment to make sense of this, to get more of the story. But Adam and Eve, Abel's parents, when they sinned, they uh, were removed from the perfect fellowship of, with God, symbolized by the Garden of Eden. They're outside the garden now. God is not gone entirely, but they don't have the same kind of relationship. It's been broken by sin. And they try to cover themselves with fig leaves, cover up their sin, symbolically covering their, the shame of what they have done. But it doesn't work. And the story is that God has to cover them, and he covers them with the skins of an animal. This is, by inference, the first sacrifice. The sacrifice of an animal to cover up our sin. And this is the theme that will run right throughout the whole Bible. Genesis 32 tells us that blessed is the one whose sin is covered, and whose uh, transgressions are forgiven. And then later in that same uh, psalm, David says, I did not try to cover my sin before the Lord. I did not hide. So the point is, we cannot cover ourselves. God must cover us. And the Old Testament sacrifices are a system of covering, pointing to the perfect sacrifice in Jesus. Okay, back to the story. Genesis 4, 1 through 7. Let's read the, the text we have here. Now Adam knew his, Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. That sounds weird, but let me tell you what it means. In Hebrew, it literally means, he has arrived, he is here. Moms and dads, how would you like to name your kid, he is here? Can you imagine if that was your name, like you walk into class? He is here, here, like you're calling off when they call off attendance, you know? That's his name. He's arrived, my son has arrived. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Wow, there is a lot going on in this passage. Um, it, a couple of questions come to mind. 
God has regard or acceptance of Abel's offering, but not for Cain's. Is God just kind of arbitrarily accepting and rejecting offerings? Or is God just really like livestock and hates crops? Or is this just a, a, the first case of sibling rivalry gone horribly wrong because we know how the story ends with Cain killing his brother Abel? Keep in mind, the whole account, and the reason it's mentioned in Hebrews 11.4, is to teach us of what it means to worship by faith, to come before the presence of God and respond in worship. What is the right way to do that? What does that look like? Apparently, Abel and Cain, grew up, they grew up in the same home, had the same mom and dad, raised in the same family, a family that feared God and worshiped God, and apparently they've been taught how to worship God because they both come, we're told, at the appointed time. So both boys come at, a right, at the same time. Both sons bring an offering. So they're following some protocol, some rules they've been taught about what it means to worship God, how to practice their faith in this way. They both show up. They both bring an offering. They come from the same family. One is accepted and one is not. Let's take a closer look at what's happening. What is Abel really teaching us here about what it means to worship God? Why is his offering acceptable and Cain's is not? The first thing we see is to, to worship by faith is to bring an acceptable offering. Hebrews 11.4 tells us that by faith, uh, Abel offered a better or more acceptable offering than Cain. Well, what's better about it? What is really going on here? The account in Genesis gives us a few more clues about not just the offering itself, but the heart of the offerer. And that's really the point here. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering, of the, an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Maybe you're catching on here a little bit. Okay, okay. So Cain just brings the leftovers, not the best. He brings God some of his junk or something average. But Abel brings the firstborn, the choicest ones of his flock, the fat portions. That's a, that's a symbol of the best he had. So is that the issue? Cain brought to God his junk. Abel brought to God his best. And so Abel's offerings accepted and Cain's is rejected. Well, yes, that's true, but there's more happening here. There's more going on. We need to ask a little deeper question. Why? What, what was behind that offering? Wh why was it offered? What's the heart or the motivation behind it? Here's the real point. You cannot detach yourself from your offering or your worship. Oh, we want to. We really want to. We want to, all of us, want to be able to come to church and do the religious thing. Say the prayers, sing the songs, give a little bit in the offering, serve a little bit, and think we don't have to deal with that part of our heart that is displeasing to God. I want to come and, and do my religious duty, and then God will smile and wink and nod at me, and that'll be okay, and never have to deal with that part of me that is in resistance, disobedience, that's rejecting, actually, what God is saying to me. The story of Abel and Cain is telling us that is not how it works. Now, it's true that God accepts us all and welcomes us as we are. But it's also true that he calls us to respond to him and not to stay as we are. We want to separate our worship from our, our heart. And what the story and the whole Bible is telling us is you cannot do it. This is not how God works. This is not the worship that God accepts. Cain's offering is rejected because it reflects his heart. Abel's offering is accepted because it reflects his heart. So let's talk about their hearts for a minute. The quality offer of the offering and the character of the offerer are intimately linked. They cannot be separated. Psalm 51, verse 17, David says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. The sacrifices of God are what's going on in here. I, I know for many of you, for me, myself included, sometimes I come to church and I go through the motions. Or I try to have my time in the word and prayers and I'm just, I'm not really listening to what the Spirit of God is saying to me. I'm not dealing with what he's trying to put a finger on. And I think I've checked the box. I'm okay. 
No, we're not. Okay. This does not mean that you don't have to offer, like it doesn't mean if your heart is right, you don't have to offer God your best. What it means is, if my heart is right, I will want to give him the very best that I have. Romans 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in a very famous verse. And by the way, I think this is the best theology of worship in a single verse in all the Bible. Here we go. I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, some translations say in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and, there's the word, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Notice what Paul says here. In light of who God is and all that he has done, his incredible mercy and grace and love for you, an unworthy sinner, because of who God is and what he's done, because of that, in view of that, what do you do? Offer your body, your whole self, your whole life, all of you, to God. This is acceptable to him. It's your spiritual worship. doesn't mean you never sin, you never screw up, you never doubt. It means, Lord, I see all that you've done for me, and the best I can is to give you my life as messed up as it is. I give it to you. I'm offering myself to you. That's what it means to offer God an acceptable sacrifice. Now, how do we do this? Okay, let me give you a couple of simple practical things. Get up in the morning, tomorrow morning, get up in the morning and say, Lord, here I am. Got a lot of fears and anxieties, a lot of worries, a lot of stress, a lot of hopes. But this day, I'm presenting myself to you. Have your way in me today. That's a great way to start. That is is an offering you're making to the Lord. Okay, you're headed into work, maybe for an important meeting or a job interview or a difficult conversation where you work and you, before you walk into the boardroom or the office or into the building, you pause and say, Lord, all right, you know, you know what's going on in my mind and heart. I'm offering my lips, my mind, my, my hands, all of me to you as I go to work this day. I want to be yours. I want to be used by you. You're making an offering of yourself to the Lord. So, okay, for you moms and dads uh, who have little ones running around, the 200th time your son or daughter asks you the same question in a whiny voice, pause, Lord, here I am. I'm offering my parenting to you. Help me. Not to, not to say something I'm going to regret that will hurt my son or daughter. I'm offering my, my parenting skills, as limited as they are to you, Father. You can do this every moment of every day. I'm not saying that I always do, but you can. Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Hosea, the ultimate prophet Hosea, in chapter 6, verse 6, I'm going to read from the New International Version, puts it this way. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God, that's an interesting phrase, sometimes called the knowledge of God, acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. What God wants as our worship, as our acceptable offering, is that we acknowledge him in every area of our lives. Do you do that? Acknowledge God over all of your life, what you think, what you say, what you do. So pausing to say, God, I'm acknowledging that you're always present, even though I'm sometimes not present to you. You're always with me, and I'm giving you myself in this moment. So, first thing that living or worshiping by faith means is an acceptable offering. My life given to God. Second, an obedient life. An obedient life. Notice that in Hebrews 11.4, we're told that Abel is commended as righteous. That's the Greek word diakos, dakaios, we get our word uh, diaksune, the, the longer form of righteousness, that Jesus is the righteous one. But it literally means to be in accordance with the character and will of God. To, do, to live what, according to what is just and right based on the character and will of God. Abel, who doesn't live that long, is called the righteous one. Jesus calls him that in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. So that you may come, to, uh, may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Righteous meaning Abel who lived in accordance with the will and character of God. To the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. He's talking about an Old Testament story we won't get into. But Jesus calls Abel righteous Abel. Meaning in a life that's trying to align with the character and will of God. An obedient life. 
Now, right alongside of Abel, the righteous one, we're given the example of Cain, his brother, who's the contrast. In fact, there's power in the contrast. In Hebrews 11, verse 4, and of course in Genesis 4, there's these contrasting stories, these two brothers. And the power is in seeing one over against the other. And we can also learn from Cain's life as well. Look at verses uh, 6 through 7 of chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. This is a powerful passage. Let me try to unpack it for us. Cain's become angry and dejected. His face fell. That's a euphemism for he's, he's, he's angry and downcast, upset. Why? Because God has not responded the way he expected. Now you might think, well, I'm not Cain. I'm not going to murder my brother or sister over something like this. But how many of us get angry, resentful, dejected when God does not do what we want him to do, expect him to do, or think he should do? And then God, how gracious is God to Cain? Cain's the one that's at fault. He's the one that is in the wrong. His heart is not right. And yet God comes to him and has this conversation. Why? God would have every right to just just dismiss Cain and get rid of him. He doesn't. He enters into a conversation with him, and he asks him a series of questions. Why are you angry? I can't help reading that, but think God's saying, why so mad? Why are you mad? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? God is clearly saying to Cain, I'm not being unfair. You're not being mistreated, Cain. You're not seeing this right. He's giving Cain an opportunity, a wake-up call, as it were. And you can see that Cain's anger and his response of violence, which comes later, but his anger at God's rejection of his offering, it it really is the, um, the betrayal. It tells us what's really going on inside his heart. It's the giveaway of what's happening in his heart. How do you respond when confronted with the sin of your own heart? How do you respond when God, through a friend, a family member, a stranger, or just in your own heart, confronts you and says, this is not good. I want to talk to you about something in your heart that's a problem. How do you respond? Is your first response humility, repentance, confession? Lord, as David prayed, put a finger on anything in me that isn't pleasing to you. Reveal it to me. Or is your first reaction, like mine sometimes is, defensiveness, rationalization, cover up, resent? Cain was angry because God didn't respond the way he expected. And God is saying, let me tell you why, Cain. Let me show you what's going on in your own heart. Notice also that God describes sin. He uses a metaphor here as sin is crouching at the door. Sin crouching. It's a personification of sin as an animal crouching. Why do animals crouch? Two reasons. One, to remain hidden. They crouch to, to lie in wait for their prey. Like, uh, I, I think of, <laughs> I can't think of the Lion King movie when, when Simba is learning how to pounce. Crouching in the weeds, right? Why? Because he's stalking. Does not want to be seen by the animal he's going to attack. That's the image that God gives Cain. says, Cain, you don't see it, but I see it. Sin is stalking you. It's crouching. It's hidden from your sight. And its desire is for you. It's about to attack. Notice he also says that it's at the door, meaning it's almost in. You've almost let the worst possible thing into your heart. But it's not too late, he says. You must rule over it. This is fascinating. God's telling Cain, knowing what Cain will do, it doesn't have to be this way. You have an opportunity here, Cain. You can still repent Surrender your heart, return, and receive mercy, and you'll be accepted. But continue on this path. It's going to devour you. It's going to cause destruction. 
And tragically, it does. That's exactly what happens in this story. And frankly, it's the story of sin. Paul says it to us in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And sin reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. It's still going on today. Sin still crouches at the door of every one of our hearts. Stalking, trying to get a foothold, to make its way in, to cause destruction to us and through us to others. So God says to Cain, sin's a predator, Cain. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that your enemy, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So be sober-minded, be watchful, be alert. Wake up, in other words. You're at a crossroads, Cain. I see where this is headed. You don't. Will you listen to me? Now, take yourselves out of the story of Genesis 4 for a minute and ask yourself, could God say that to you? There's something in your heart that you rationalize and you dismiss and you defend and you try to cover up. But you do not see how dangerous it is for you. Some unforgiveness you're harboring. Some resentment toward this person who hurt you. Some uh, pattern of behavior that is unethical and, and ungodly and you won't deal with it. You hide it. But the truth is, it's hiding from you. How, how deadly it really is. Crouching. How, how gracious is God who says to Cain, who's going to be the first murderer in history. But here's the reality. Cain was a murderer in his heart before he was ever a murderer with his hands. Jesus says this to us in the Sermon on the Mount. That if you, if you, if you, anyone who commits murder is in danger of judgment. But he says, I, I or guilty of judgment, but I tell you, if you curse your brother... If you're angry with him, you're in the same danger. It begins in here. All right, last. A lasting witness. So Abel is held up to us as an example of what it means to worship. An acceptable offering, my whole life in humility given to God. An obedient life, a righteous life that lives in accordance with the will of God. And then that, that produces a lasting witness. You know the tragic ending of the Cain and Abel story. In fact, in Jude 11, we're told, uh, Jude writes this way, the, the woe to them for they walked in the way of Cain. Jesus says, righteous Abel. There's a way of Abel and a way of Cain. The lasting, so, so Abel's life is a warning to us, but, or Cain's life, I should say, but Abel's life is a witness to us. Look at verse 4 once more. By faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. That's the acceptable sacrifice. Through which he was commended as righteous, obedient life. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. The son of Adam and Eve, his life still speaks through his faith. Isn't that amazing? That's astounding to me. Think about that. He speaks to us. That means your life and my life can speak as well when we live by faith. Our lives have something to say about the character of God, the goodness of God, the nature of who he is. Abel's life is speaking to us today about what it means to live a life of humility and surrender and righteousness and obedience and how that is acceptable to God as our worship. Genesis chapter 4 verse 10, after Cain kills Abel, God comes to, a, to Cain again. They have another conversation. And God says this. The Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Your brother's bl blood is personified, has a voice. It's crying out. For what? For justice. Cain died tragically at the hands of his, his corrupt brother. And his blood cries out from the ground for justice. It demands justice. Cain, Abel did not give up his life. It was taken from him. And therefore, his, it's a symbol of all the brokenness, corruption, and darkness of the world. And it's crying out for something. But I want you to look at the way the, the writer of Hebrews puts this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. Hebrews 12, verse 24 says this. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This new covenant in Jesus 
You hear what's being said there? Abel's did not give up his life. It was taken from him. And so his blood cries out for justice. Jesus gave his life willingly for all of us. And his blood is that justice meted out by God on the cross. He's the one who gave himself. And so his blood is also speaking to us. So when we read that Abel, though through his faith, though he's died, he still speaks, what is he saying? He's saying, surrender your life to the God who loves you. Respond to him in humility and obedience. Why? Because he gave his life for you. The blood of Jesus, the new covenant, speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Isn't this, this is an incredible Old Testament story held up to us as an example of what it means to live by faith, to worship God by faith. And Jesus' blood, which speaks a better word than that of Abel, is the reason why we worship. What does this have to do with you? As you come into God's presence with God's people, be reminded that this is why we worship. We are responding in view of the mercy of God to offer ourselves. Tomorrow, when you get up, pray, God, here I am in view of your mercy. I'm giving myself to you because you gave yourself for me. Let's be a, a worshiping people who respond to who, to who God is with all of who we are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this ancient story and its power in our lives today. And we confess there's a little bit of Cain lurking in every one of our hearts. We get resentful and angry and bitter when things don't go our way or when we think you should respond differently. But the truth is, you have already responded in Jesus, and we are the ones whose hearts may be made right. So we, may we hear you speak to us about what's wrong in our hearts that you want to correct. May we listen and respond and realign ourselves and become like righteous Abel, who offer you all of ourselves, live obediently, and through our faith that our life would speak of your goodness and glory. We pray it in your name. Amen. I hope that we never worship quite the same way again because of who God is and what he's done. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.